everyone. My name is Deanna Zercher and I am a moderator here at UIS for the Engaged Citizenship Common Experience, also known as ECHE Speaker Series. And I want to um, just welcome you to our first series, uh, first event for the fall. And um, we are going to get a nice experience here talking with uh, Mike Miller and um, Brian uh, Gillis this afternoon or this evening already, right? So what we wanna do is really tie our learning objectives for this event for our, our students in the class. And for this particular event, we are recognizing the social responsibility of the individual within a larger community and distinguishing the possibilities and limitations of social change. I do want to uh, let you know that audio or video recording of this event without expressed written consent is prohibited. Please silence and put away all your electronic devices, including your cell phone. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Mike Miller and Brian Gillis have worked together as an artistic team since 2006, creating projects ranging from additioned multiples to site-specific specific installations and um, actions. Mike is a professor right here at UIS, and Brian is currently a professor of art and director of the Center for Art Research at the University of Oregon. They initially met uh, as colleagues right here in the visual arts program at UIS in 2005. Their collaborative projects include Across the Divide, Reconsidering the Other, at the Illinois State Museum, also free radio at the Q Foundation for the Arts in New York, and Mapping Harbin at the Academy of Art and Design in Hia Long John University, China. They exhibit as Service Works, which is a unique platform that partners with a variety of people and institutions to provide access to socially relevant resources, opportunities, and information through art and social design. Their exhibit, A Public Commons, is now on view at the UIS Visual Arts Gallery, and an exhibition reception will take place um, at the gallery immediately following this lecture. So please welcome Mike Miller and Brian Gillis. Testing, testing. Hello. Okay, so uh, I'm Mike Miller. I uh, had the honor of taking a job here in 2002. Uh, it was my first tenure track opportunity in academia. Um, thankfully, it was the last tenure track <laughs> opportunity that I took advantage of. Uh, and one of the great things about that position at that time is that a decision had been made to start uh, reinvesting in the arts with faculty. We have um, former music faculty here. Uh, all of us came in at that time and there was a reinvigoration and I had the nice duty being the chair, we called them conveners. Maybe we could talk about what a convener is. Uh, a legacy from Sangamon State uh, University which UIS previously was titled Sangamon State and that rich history is part of what we're tapping into with this piece. Um, and in 2005, I was searching for a ceramics professor, and I was lucky enough to hire Brian Gillis. I was the chair of that search committee. Uh, I knew right away that we had, uh, you know, a fantastic colleague and a real dynamic person, and uh, we did a lot of things together as colleagues, as faculty within the department, within the UIS campus, and in, in Springfield community initially, and I think that's how we started to collaborate. The collaboration grew naturally uh, out of our uh, work in the department and our work in the community f uh, on behalf of the department and then we said why don't we try some creative projects too so that's where it launched um, you want to take over for a moment yeah and, um, I, I want to also just say thank you individually um, to you Mike and Karen for always being a family here for me and for all the colleagues that I see from the old days and just um, the time being here was really special because this was like the dawn of UIS. I think we came maybe three, four, or five years after. Um, we saw the beginning of the freshman class coming in. Um, and there was definitely a wake of what this place was um, 
as Sangamon State and its investment in com community and a responsibility um, to community that was really interesting. Some of that was structural through um, not having department heads but conveners and um, location of things and there's some really um, special DNA here. So I just want to say thanks um, for always being so welcoming. Um, also, I want to um, just um, mention publicly the privilege I feel to be in uh, this um, relationship and a community like this. And would like to just take a, a moment to acknowledge that there's eight billion people on Earth, and uh, a lot of them don't have the privilege to assemble um, under free inquiry like we do, um, or freedom. Um, related to gender, race, socioeconomic issues, or things like that. So to me, this is a very special position in the world that I get to have, where we get to kind of process publicly. And really, um, what Mike and I have always done is processed together. And we kind of um, became real good friends as intellectual partners and as um, partners in like uh, building something together for um, UIS, and it's really always been about speculative inquiry that comes from this safe space, um, asking questions related to the things that we're seeing outside of us, and not necessarily performing knowledge, uh, which is something that I feel is um, really weighty and difficult to manage um, being an academic where you're performing in front of students and colleagues. And so it's always been this really safe space for inquiry. Um, so Mike and I built curriculum together. We did a lot of programs in the city and around um, on campus. Um, and then when I left to go to Portland that first summer, they were building a maker space um, in Portland in this basement. I think we have an image. It was this brand new space with 3D printers and mills and laser cutters, and we didn't know anything about any of that. We had done um, computer uh, design uh, programs, but nothing um, CAD or 3D related. And we basically just camped out in this place for two weeks and had this wonderful technician, um, and we just kind of found image and figured out um, technology and really it was about like a free experiment. Yeah, at, the, at this moment a lot of this technology had just <clears throat> come online uh, in a usable way in a desktop smaller format. Prior to that it was commercially available. Actually mm -hmm. we did a residency that tapped into some of that as well. But this was kind of the first genera generation of machines that was accessible to universities, uh, financially ex accessible they did you know they spent a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars on this equipment but you know prior to that one machine might <coughs> take that amount of money in a commercial setting also they had just unboxed all this stuff mm -hmm. we literally got to play with the toys before anybody else uh, played mm -hmm. with the toys so that was quite fun these were cutting edge machines at the time and as Brian's mentioned speculative in inquiry we are experimenters, we are testers, we are, uh, we like to play. We don't necessarily go in with an agenda. Um, we might have had some loose concepts about form. These were clouds, for example. We were pioneering, kind of figuring out ways to make the notion of a cloud a hundred different ways. The notion of an explosion or a burst a hundred different ways. Uh, and we set about the task of making. I think that's fundamental to both Brian and my practice is learning about concepts through making, through experiencing mm -hmm. material and converting material and uh, kind of inhabiting material. Mm -hmm. uh, so, And you know, uh, what's really great about having a relationship with someone for almost 20 years is all the different seasons you go through and all the different ways you develop individually and together. And seldom in relationships do you have moments like this where you have to speak publicly. But what's nice about this is we could look back and see what we do. And it seems recently we've realized we either parachute into a place and are like these mad scientists, or we have lots and lots of prep work to convene space for others. And so this talk is going to be um, some experiments, mad science on the front end, and some ways we convene on the back end. And a lot of who we are together comes from who we are separately. So um, Mike had just done this pretty um, extensive 
um, series uh, dealing with fire and explosions, and we needed just a way to kind of figure out how to learn these um, digital tools. And so we started with um, enigmatic forms we didn't understand. Um, clouds, explosions, things like that. And we just tried to do everything we thought was possible. So what you're looking at here is uh, we just painted a piece of paper with blue uh, paint and then we laser cut into it. Um, and we just moved through tons of files and different forms. Uh, and we ended up being asked to do a show um, afterwards, and it seemed um, like this didn't come from a place that was like a, uh, there could be some sort of thesis statement around this work. So we felt that it was um, the, the most honest way to do this is try to um, uh, show it as the tabletop. And we decided to call it the Expeditionary Journal. I think we were both reading The Age of Wonder at the time. That was um, this really wonderful book about like the dawn of science through the lens of these Western men of privilege. And really, that's who we were. We were both supported. We were both able to go on this voyage and just like pick and experiment and find uh, what's core to it. So there, there were these things around that time historically called the, the Wunderkammer. They were these curi uh, cabinets of curiosities. So uh, again, privileged aristocratic men of uh, means would gather all these unusual uh, objects, a narwhal tusk, a you know, uh, a uh, cultural artifact from Africa, all these things, and they'd put it in this closet, a kind of cabinet of curiosities. So this, we were definitely thinking about this was the new generation of that cabinet of curiosities. These were, these were those strange new forms that were created by these uh, newly accessible m machines and technology. Uh, and so we made our, uh, I guess, scientific benches of curiosities. Uh, so we ended up assembling all this. It, what happened was we made all of these things. And then we went into this, we didn't know we were going to exhibit necessarily, mm -hmm. and we went into this kind of jazz fusion moment where we were collaging it all together. You know, like that was a different step. And it was also a different step in our collaborative evolution, I think. It was the first time we had really uh, worked together to compose in that way. And that's, a, that's a, an interesting negotiation with another human being, right? I'm a painter, I, I paint in a certain way, I compose my work in a certain way. Brian is a uh, ceramicist. He builds his work in a certain way. And we had to let all of that identity go a little bit and construct a new identity that was our collaborative identity. And this is one of the pieces where that, I think, really occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know what? We have to move. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so we're just going to show you a couple of um, series of experiments. So what we just showed you was like really the first time we had done this together. We had done a couple of projects. Um, publicly before, um, but never got dropped into a space together. And a lot of that, there's like a social negotiation between people. Um, recently, we've um, come to realize there's something we call like the third brain. You know, there's both a way that you're better and more expansive together, and also ways that you kind of may not be as good because you're together. And I think those of you who've been in relationships for a long time too um, can see that. Um, so there was, that was kind of like a lot. You know, we had never lived together and things like that. Um, this was a, our most recent kind of similar experimentation project where um, we had an opportunity to do a public artwork um, for the Terrain Biennial through Allison Locker and Jeff Robinson, the curators. And uh, our site was in northern Ennis Park, Ennis uh, Park northern in Springfield. northern Springfield. And we had talked about what we thought we wanted to do, like s conceptually something that reflects the neighborhood to itself and how does sculpture do that. And we couldn't really find a form. And so we decided, OK, well, Mike, why don't you come out to University of Oregon and we'll just occupy the print lab and just kind of use the language of print as like a known material and just go through form. And so really, we just started with an image of the front lawn of the site with this house, and we just iterated through possible forms. Yeah, one of the great things about terrain is that it brings uh, public sculpture to a kind of 
intimate level. It brings it to someone's front yard. It's not out in the middle of some huge public space that has been marked as special and privileged. Uh, it's somebody's front lawn, you know, and there's a host of those uh, properties that allow that. And so uh, we picked this site. It was across the street from the park, which we really liked. Uh, we felt like this park was an interesting place that really broke uh, social, socioeconomically, on one side there were more gentrified houses, on the other side there were some rentals and some more rundown properties. It was, it was this interesting kind of crossroads of a lot of what was going on in that community up there. And we had this notion of what is the liminal, okay? So everybody knows what subliminal is. It's the thing that you're not aware of that happens, right? It's below your liminal level. The liminal is in between your consciousness and that subliminal. It's this little point, that uh, this way station that you check through uh, on the way to recognition. This is a psychological term. Uh, we wanted to make that, we wanted to make that, that absence or that gap or try to insert that kind of Fisher into this site and, as Brian said, maybe reflect that site back on itself. Uh, have people walk into that space and feel differently about it. And mm -hmm. uh, so we experimented with a lot of forms uh, through the prints, really. Like mm -hmm. the print became the, the testing ground. Again, we're testing, we're experimenting. Right. Proving. And I, I think in a lot of ways with us, the um, limits or constraints of a material or time kind of is really generative. Um, and so you, you, at some point, we were making these things that we're really excited about formally, but we were like, okay, well, this just looks like it's a wall. Or it, it was very, a very simple sculptural move, really. And a lot of, um, we came to the word liminal, just talking about this um, site, it's this gorgeous park, but you see a very clear um, distinction that like echoes um, some of the historic imbalances in Springfield and in the nation and things like that. But what you also see is everybody walks around the park. So there's the home sites and uh, very stark differences, but there's an owner, collective ownership in some way. So we wanted something to be present and absent and um, ultimately we decided the best thing to do is to like get out of the way as much as possible. Something that um, we've grown very conscious of being um, convening spaces is what does it mean for us to parachute into another community, not be of that community? Even though Mike is living in Springfield now for 20 years, he's not living in that, in that park. So how do you um, drop in responsibly and um, talk to the people who are there and try to understand the realities of people who are there without inserting some sort of uh, descriptive or, or illustrative um, statement about something. And so I think a lot of the things we end up doing is to condition a space for there to be some sort of moment that happens for the viewer or the participant themselves. And this is really just a simple mirror that's in space. And you know, as we were there, um, there's just something curious about this, and it uh, warps the uh, what you're used to seeing. Um, from talking to folks, our sense was that um, this isn't a park that people go to who don't live there. This is a park for that neighborhood. For this guy and his dogs. Yeah. But it, can you go back to that for one second? So, but I hope you can see, like, as a painter, I have to kind of point this out. Like, one of the things that I talk about a lot in my painting classes is. Paintings are about space. Paintings are about developing space, either pr using color or form or perspective to project a space, a three-dimensional space, or a void, okay? So there's times in abstract painting when you can see a shape as receding or you can see it as projecting. And I think this does that in, that in the real world. And that was a real accomplishment, I felt like, visually, that this is really did kind of knock a hole in what was otherwise just a perfectly normal, you know, sort of residential street, it did that liminal thing. You right. know, it, it knocked this weird kind of hole into the physical space of the everyday and the mundane and the ordinary. Yeah. And maybe arrested people for a moment to look around, wait, what happened? You yeah. Know, that's not how space operates. Uh, so that was the move. Point. 
Yeah, the, and we were talking a lot about like the palpable sense of something being liminal that is not like um, felt physically often, and that it, I think that's a good way to put it. It kind of like knocked a hole. It like ripped uh, what was there. So our, our thought was today we'll kind of introduce you a little bit to how we think like experimentally, and then talk to you a little bit about ways that we've convened. Um, space and then um, let there be some Q&A at the end, um, hoping that you'll get some things out of us that we're not um, thinking about. Um, so uh, in 2007, <clears throat> we had this amazing dean, um, Margot Dooley, um, who um, said, hey, I just learned about this uh, riot that happened here in 1908. Um, and I don't know if she told you or me or both of us at the same time. And um, I think we had been talking to her about something we were doing. And she was like, you should look into doing something with this. Um, so Mike and I started to look into this uh, thing that's called a riot in 1908. And I don't know if folks here are aware of this. It was really just basically um, a violent band of white men moving into the black neighborhoods, uh, burning and killing people. Um, but in 1908, there was this massive, uh, terrible thing that happened. And we started to ask people from the school district, people at the university, um, people in the government, um, and people at the N NAACP if they knew about this, and people hadn't. So we set out to try to um, build programming around this um, citywide to mark the 100-year uh, point of this so that we could check in and try to understand this history and what's still present today. Um, and there were a number of things that happened ranging from uh, curriculum initiatives to um, uh, panel discussions and lectures and um, also there was some um, oral history projects that came forward. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'd be curious to know um, how many of you all live in Springfield, Illinois? And how many of you know about the 1908 riot? Okay. All right. It was um, at the time that we were doing this, uh, we had a um, historian, a high school history teacher who knew nothing about it. Um, we worked with these two men here. On the left is Dan, and on the right is Johnny. Um, both of these men lived in Springfield their whole lives. They both worked at the university for their whole careers. Neither one of them know, knew about this um, riot. And so um, we were asked to be in a show after you know, starting all this stuff up. There was this show um, called Across the Divide that I think Deanne uh, mentioned um, at the Illinois State Museum. And our idea was to try to kind of convene a space that um, was uh, basically um, a bunch of theater around a very simple fact that human beings are 99.99999% the same genetically. And what we did is we took Johnny and Dan, these were friends for 40 years, both of them Vietnam vets, both of them with families here, um, both of them people we had a relationship with. Um, we uh, worked with Jim Bonacum, who's a biologist here, and we synthesized both of their DNA and you could just plot them next to each other and see if there's an anomaly. Um, and we basically set up this space where people, um, we employed a lab tech to um, try to find the anomaly basically by hand. A computer program could do it very simply. Um, there wasn't uh, very much difference, um, but we basically set up this space and then there was just someone in the space trying to look for the anomaly. The anomaly he's talking about is the race gene, right? Like uh, uh, some scientific proof of some clear and significant differentiation. And the, the point was, it was the great chase. It was not achievable. Um, the, we also kind of curated this bookshelf over here, which has textbooks on eugenics, which has a kind of history of race and what had been accepted scientific knowledge, quote unquote, at different times in history. So it, it was an exploration. When people walked in the site, they're like, what is all this stuff? Well, these, we bound these books, one in pink pigskin and representing the Caucasian uh, DNA, the other in uh, brown leather representing the African genome, okay? And the idea being 
this researcher would constantly and continuously, like Sisyphus pushing a rock up a hill, continue to try to find this. It wasn't fine. It was not to be found, right? right. Um, so we cr kind of built a lab that uh, a visual lab, a facsimile of a lab, right. a prop that function symbolically as a lab. And basically the lab tech would go to the mitochondrial DNA of people of European descent and then try to find it in the, the book for people of African descent. Yeah. And they never found it. <laughs> There's a lot of little cute stuff that's uh, curated into that, but we can't get into all that. There's some love notes to the, uh, Karen Miller. There are no love notes to Karen and Miller. And There's this funny little video that we found from like the 50s, which is people dancing around as, uh, you know, uh, mitochondrial Double DNA. <laughs> Just all these goofy ways that human beings have tried to understand and project and symbolize mm -hmm. what we're made of um, throughout history. We need to keep rolling though. Um, and I think this was the first time that we really convened space in a way that was about us um, being conveners rather than um, some sort of authority um, or like direct facilitator. So we had an opportunity to turn a gallery space in uh, the Chelsea area of Manhattan into a cultural hub. And um, this place um, up in Chelsea is really at the time, it was all commercial galleries and it was really only um, poor art handlers and artists who are working there or well-heeled um, investment bankers and people who kind of roll up and buy stuff. Um, but the greater New York area really wasn't going there. Um, so our idea was to kind of try to open this up um, as a cultural hub for the um, uh, different populations throughout the city. And so um, we kind of uh, uh, started from a point of departure thinking about free radio as uh, pirate radio as something that has a radial broadcast that's just completely available if you're within proximity and use that as the um, primary kind of driving foundation for the work there's a rich history of like pirate radio i don't know if you guys are familiar with this historically it's really interesting like one of the most famous examples was there was a radio station that constantly broadcast from West Berlin across the wall into East Berlin when that was the case. And so you had this constant barrage of kind of Western information, uh, news from around the world that would not be accessible otherwise. Uh, messages about democracy and about, you know, uh, notions that were not celebrated in East Berlin. Uh, so there's, there is a social justice aspect to the history of pirate radio uh, along with just you know, bootlegging some uh, broadcast ways. Yeah, and there's a history of um, institutions and governments restricting access right. and trying to deny that. And I think that felt um, really important to us. And so really what we try to do here is condition a space that is accessible and usable um, upon entering rather than to be looked at, it's to be operated in a way. And we collaborated with four different um, community groups throughout the New York City metropolitan area to occupy the space for a week at a time. And we intentionally chose these um, groups as groups that had like a burgeoning voice. And the idea was that they had to occupy the space um, to do the work that they do. And then at the end, they had to have some sort of broadcast. And we're, we're trying to define broadcast very widely. So um, it ended up being the case that there was, uh, we partnered with the, Roth, the Moth Radio Hour with one of the groups, um, which was a youth theater group. And it was a relatively straight um, AM radio broadcast. Um, we also partnered with a group of young adult authors um, not uh, authors who are young adults, but authors who write for young adults. And they occupied the space and had meetings and did work. And at the end, they had book swaps and they made zines that um, got distributed. At and you keep saying occupy, so we should say also Occupy Wall Street held meetings. Yeah, this was around the time Occupy Wall Street was happening. Um, and uh, there was Occupy, uh, a lot of different Occupy subgroups <laughs> that came through this one um, collection of people we had. And really what we did is condition the space. We made this manual 
that had a lot of history um, and technical references um, and a big old note section. And we work with the- And we commissioned a couple art, uh, articles that were written about the piece and about the mm -hmm. history of free radio. Mm -hmm. Jim Grubbs. Jim Grubbs wrote, wrote a piece. Uh, that uh, some uh -huh. of you He's remember a professor Jim Grubbs. Here. He's a communications professor yep. here. And um, we worked with the groups ahead of time to start with a workshop um, that somehow served them in some capacity, helped, uh, there was a budget for that, I mm -hmm. think. We um, supported them throughout the week and then we supported their broadcast. It, it's, this is a very important piece for the piece that we're doing now because what we did is we sort of built a facility. Like we used our position as artists and art professors who could get a grant or get, um, you know, apply for this show and be accepted to have this. You know, that's a privilege as Brian was talking about before. Once we have the space, we then curated the people that could be in it and we turned it over to them for the content in a mm -hmm. way. So this is, what, this is an important part of our new practice, our convening practice as Brian has said it. It's, uh, there, I think we both have a little bit of uh, an uneasiness about the, the kind of ego and the kind of uh, chest beating, maybe that's too strong, but the idea of an artist as a genius or an artist as a creative master of some kind. Uh, that often gets in the way of actually doing socially productive things. Okay, mm -hmm. that's more about maybe producing work that you know escalates in price for wealthy investors, right? Like that's that's a, one of the downsides of the art market. Mm -hmm. um, so we're less interested in put branding our name on something. We we're interested in conditioning, as he said, to create these facilities and this opportunity for people who come in and share meaningful social exchange. Okay, and that, I think that's what we were trying to do with this piece, and it's certainly what we're doing with the uh, piece that's in the gallery right now. Or the, and the, to say it's a piece in the gallery, it's an action. It's a, it's a community uh, invitation. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But this is a very important uh, origin of the concept that we're pursuing in the gallery here. Yeah, I think that it's important in a lot of different ways. I think um, philosophically and theoretically, like for us as um, creative partners, but then also mechanically, um, this was kind of done like the band, the Postal Service made albums where they'd send things through the mail. So, you know, we prepared for this for about a year and a half, ranging from building things in place to trainings and things like that. And one of the things that um, ended up I think leading to this seed of anonymity, um, as Deanna mentioned at the beginning, um, the project um, A Public Commons is not by Brian Gillis and Mike Miller, it's by Service Works. This was an occasion where um, Mike and I were kind of core producers, I forget what we called it, we, we can't figure out ways to really talk about this other than facilitator, convener, producer, but uh, when we got this opportunity, we thought we need to bring people in. So we um, brought in a, a theater educator, um, computer scientist, some builders, and there was really like five or six of us who were doing this together. But because we had gotten the exhibition, the vinyl on the wall says our names, not everybody's names. And there's this interesting push and pull uh, related to like markets um, through the authority of a maker or an artist that ends up getting um, in the way of the work. Um, and this was a really good example of we conditioned the space and then we were not there at all. This was owned and occupied by other people. It's akin to the uh, anonymity of the designer of the seats that you're on and your body kind of understands its use and there's a relationship your body has to it. Um, and maybe uh, to some people it'd be important who the designer was, but it's more about body knowledge or use value um, than it is about exchange value. Yeah. So these are some of the things um, we ended up partnering with these groups, which ended up leading to partnerships with other people. And we had so many people who were coming to the space who had never been to that part of uh, New York, who were there for multiple generations. And so it was not there as tourists, it was there as um, t you know owning a part of it for that moment and using that specific um, shift in their frame. Well, and let me say this, just look at this image. We could not have constructed something as rich and interesting as what's going on on that stage right there, Brian and I. Uh, this is like, by turning this over to other groups, 
it, it enriches the process. It becomes a social dialogue. It becomes an exchange. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, a deliverable from Brian and I to the world. It's an invitation for this to happen, you know, in a place where this never happens, okay? Right. Um, that's the point. And what's Rich's outfit called? And totally. Uh, yeah, my brother runs a, a um, youth music out, uh, outreach and, and music program in New York called um, Upbeat NYC. And he's actually been pretty successful. He and his wife uh, developed it, founded mm -hmm. it, started it. And um, so this was a part of um, Upbeat NYC's occupation. They were like maybe three, four years into this um, nonprofit that was educating young musicians um, within this system that didn't really have a lot of resources through public schools. Right, and things so these like kids that. come down to Chelsea in this kind of unbelievable kind of, in some ways, very sterile environment. But, yeah. um, and and that, this, this changed that environment. You yeah, know, for the time that the show ran, yeah. it was a richer place for that time. So people made music there. People um, discussed the merits and the um, problems with printed matter um, through book publishing. A, a novel or a, a writer came in and read his novella into the sound studio. Like so, people were invited to come in and participate who weren't yeah, scripted. Yeah. Go yeah. back. To, so this was a sound studio. This portable sound studio. This guy walked in off the street and recorded and read his novella into the into the record. So there's a so he self-published in the piece. Yeah, there's a live public radio um, option at all times, and then there was um, a reprographic center with a photocopy machine. There were different types of um, things. These are all kind of um, objects that could be used to exercise one definition of broadcast or another. Okay, and uh, we're almost done and ready to talk a little bit. Ah, Sangamon State. So, um, Sangamon State, all of you who are students here, um, you should do a little research on Sangamon State. Sangamon State was an interesting place. Uh, Sangamon State was not some cookie cutter um, university it was a pretty revolutionary educational model. Uh, it was 1971 when it was founded. Uh, there are still people in the community, although I think maybe they're getting pretty old now, that really resented Sangamon State. You know, it was the hippies out there, you know, running around naked and uh, whatever. Um, or at least that was the way it was typecast. But what was really going on was a lot of really innovative educational models that weren't typical. Uh, one of the really important things was a notion of a non-hierarchical classroom that instead of a professor coming in and again projecting knowledge, or what did you say, performing knowledge um, and mastery, they built these really strange classrooms that were like, they called them the pit, you know. It was like a bunch of lounge furniture. They built these steps against the wall. And this might be what a class looks like. And which one's the professor again? Like, I don't know. Do you know? Can you tell? Um, there, there's a few in there that could be. Um, the point being leveling with space, using architecture, using, like Brian was talking about, the chairs that you're sitting in right now are making your body perform in a particular way. You're comfortable. You're uncomfortable. Uh, my wife is in the uh, furniture business. There's a lot of theory about how furniture operates and how it either produces and promotes communication or it inhibits and restricts communication, which sometimes is what people want to restrict communication. All right? uh, these were designed to promote communication, mm -hmm. a different kind of communication, a non-hierarchical communication. And we were pretty taken with that. Mm -hmm. We were taken with lots of things, saying them in state. Mm -hmm. Really, so for example, all these team taught classes in the Cap Scholars program, those are a legacy from saying them in state. There was a lot of team teaching, which was not uh, an obvious thing to do in 1971. Mm -hmm. um, our gen ed curriculum really, I think, is heavily influenced. The speaker series that you're doing right now in this space is a legacy from Sangamon State. That doesn't happen at every university. I was just talking to Brian. He's at the University of Oregon. Research One, big school, long legacy. They don't have something like this there, okay? This is unique, what you're doing right now. You're hearing from a, 
a, a speaker that you wouldn't normally hear from, you know, and you're being asked to do that as part of your regular gen ed curriculum, whether you're going to be a nurse or uh, any field, psychologist, whatever. So that's a legacy of Sangamon State, and mm -hmm. we wanted to remember that and promote that, some of that innovation that occurred at the onset of this place. Yeah, so um, we kind of came here at this time of transition, as we mentioned earlier, and also uh, Mike and I are, I think, um, Mike and I, and I think those of you who would be uh, the, the generation after us as our students, we're in this turning point within the field of art that um, I think in our time together, we've, also, we've always thought about, like, we, maybe we need a hard reset for what the education model is for art. And I think a lot of us who have been in education for a while have been thinking we need that through from the K-12 system all the way through in so many ways. Um, but. Uh, we, there were still people we were working with who were from Sangamon State, and there was a lot of hemming and hawing about what was possible back then and what's not possible now. Um, but it was very clear that there's some uh, ways that you can afford um, exchange and discourse and cooperation that were no longer embedded into the structure of the thing. And we kind of kept going back to, you know, uh, for instance, I talked about um, there being a convener. Um, they also made faculty offices intentionally next to people who weren't in their department. You know, there were some very thoughtful ways that they, they forced people um, out of their comfort zone to, to have exchange. Um, and so these pits were these non-hierarchical spaces, and we're trying to, um, something that um, I've been thinking a lot about in my own practice, and we've been talking a lot about as friends, is like, how can you be invisible? And uh, not just remove that authority or that aura of the genius or the artist, but let the work kind of be understood on its own. Um, and so it was just natural for us to kind of think about um, I have to advance this manually. Okay. Yeah, it died. There's a recording, so I don't want to copy it. Allison, you want to advance for us? You want to advance it for us? Oh, sure. Thank you. I got it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we, uh, we were always struck by these pits because they were just these very simple um, classroom spaces where it looked like they used the carpet that was available, the materials that were available, they were custom made to the um, individual spaces. Um, and we set out to make something that it could be something that supports discourse. And so there's the physical place, the physical space, and then we're collaborating with different moderators to occupy the space um, for, throughout the next month. Um, and we conceived of this as something that is movable depending on what uh, kind of work needs to be done in that space. So yeah, this is definitely, uh, our solution is not the old pit necessarily. We're in a different space, but it's kind of, it does channel the 70s, right? It's this carpeted furniture. Um, it's actually quite tactically like enjoyable, strangely. We did not really understand that that would happen. Um, it's a lot of fun to play with, all right? It's like a big set of Legos or something, and you can reconfigure. And we have this notion that we could approximate something like this non-hierarchical activity, uh, and we wonder if this will work. And this is, again, speculative, right? It's inquiry. It's like, maybe this will work. Let's try this. Mm -hmm. uh, let's try to build this, this environment that mm -hmm. might change the way people interact with one another and knock some of the traditional roles away. Mm -hmm. And so we have four um, formal discussions, convenings that we have assembled. And again, we're tapping people, not us. We pick the people. We do get to curate the people, right? Mm -hmm. But um, then we turn it over to the moderator to have any discussion that they feel is relevant. So we have a nurse at Memorial Hospital who is hosting a discussion. She has administrators. Her, her discussion will be about mental health. And she also has some homeless people that have mental health issues. And those people will be in a space together, all right? Um, along with other health care mm -hmm. uh, pro providers, um, people that work in that field. That's one, okay? Yeah. Brian and I are let doing, me, yeah. Let me say one thing yeah. about that. Um, 
the, the way that space dicta dictates community and exchange and things like that was very striking related to Sangamon State. Also, Sangamon State um, growing out of the moment that was happening in 1971 was very striking. There's a war, there's massive civil rights issues, um, issues related to gender, um, you know, all sorts of issues. And one of the things that we've been feeling and thinking about, I would imagine most of you in this room, is that there's difficulty talking across ideological positions right now. And a lot of that has to do with us not being in spaces with people who are, um, think differently than us to be able to talk across ideological positions. And so um, the pit was kind of like this neutral space that was non-hierarchical. And so what we set out to do with this is be this neutral space that's non-hierarchical. -hierarch and we wanted um, communities to assemble across ideological positions in these neutral spaces. So we tried to um, choose facilitators who are working in fields that are at the center in these positions. So one is with healthcare. Um, we're gonna, um, on Saturday, we're gonna convene kind of like a think tank related to um, education. And so we're gonna have um, current students, former students, administrators, teachers there to kind of just understand um, how socially responsive could be has been, what could it be in the future, um, to understand it from the perspective of the learner, the education industrial complex, and also the society around it that supports it. And so um, that'll be the first official one on Saturday. Right, and we just wanna say, like we have our group of people that we have assembled, but everyone here is welcome to come to that and observe and also communicate and participate um, in the space from 10 to noon on Saturday, this Saturday the 16th. And all of these will be open to the public. Um, so uh, you wanna run through the schedule or do you have? Uh, you know, we didn't put the schedule up, no. um, but we are gonna have. Um, we're having a reception at the gallery afterwards. Yeah, we'll, um, we're gonna invite you all to come to the gallery after this. We can have a big old parade there and just assemble in the space. Um, but in addition to these, uh, we'll talk more about those four um, moments at the gallery. But in addition to that, um, we wanna offer to you that this space outside of these four formal two-hour occupations could be used by you in any capacity. Um, the gallery's open from 11 to six. Oh, there's Mike and I. That's after, when we finished at 1.30 uh, in the morning. We're averaging, I think it was more like three. <laughs> Looking maybe. pretty uh, beleaguered there. Yeah. Huh? We're, we're averaging like four hours of sleep for nine <laughs> days. Um, but you could um, use your phone to um, get to the website through this QR code um, to formally sign up for a slot there. If you're teaching a class or you are leading a, a student group or something like that, or even a church group off campus or something off campus, um, you're welcome to sign up to use the space. I think we have it for two hour increments. and. I forget, we could uh, talk more about it at the space and um, there's some support for it if you need projectors or um, tech support um, and we will also configure the space for you. Um, so, so, I mean, the so again, like, yes, we have these formal meetings about things that we think are really relevant. We're trying to get some people in the space uh, that can speak to these very critical issues in our society right now. We have two separate, uh, uh, groups that are dealing with social justice issues. Um, we want you to use it too, okay? Like this is the idea, it's for the community, not just the UIS community, the Springfield community, the Chicago community, whatever. Um, anybody can sign up and use it. And the point being, run your own experiment in this space, you know? Gather some people together that you, you know, you don't have to be a faculty member, you don't have to be a leader of a student group, sign up and Use the space, it's an invitation. The whole thing is an experiment, an invitation. We want you to participate in the experiment too, uh, seriously. Like, mm -hmm. that would be ideal, that would be so wonderful yeah. if, yeah. Yeah, so um, this is just an example of Mike bringing his class there, and it's just a <laughs> kind of cool place to Yeah, be. this wasn't so great, we were just handing the syllabus out, uh -huh. but you know. Yeah, but uh, we wanted this to be just like a quick primer of the things that we've done together, where we're at now and what we're thinking and open this up for questions um, for 
10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, so if there's any questions from the audience, we have a couple okay. people with mics that could come around. Yeah, please ask us questions. You got someone coming? Okay. There's someone right there in the yeah. red shirt. Yep, I'll give her the mic. All right, so we're going to um, have an opportunity to ask some questions of our presenters, Mike and Brian. And I will ask that you uh, wait for the microphone um, because it's being recorded and we want to make sure that we can clearly hear your uh, questions and the answers on the recording. So who has a first question? I've got a person right over here. Wait for the microphone. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question was, so I see that like in your guys's like envision of the pit, it's very like square. And typically when I think of like a pit from like the 70s, it's typically more circular. Was like there a set reason for that or is that just how like SSU did it and that's kind of what it was based off of? But like were the angles taken into consideration when creating everything? That's an excellent question. Yeah. The, the pits at uh, Sangamon State actually were mostly octagonal. And uh, we built this system based on um, the uh, proportions of a body and the proportions of the available lumber. And we wanted to do something that's simple and a simple model. Um, so there's like, um, I think like five different unit sizes that could be stacked in different ways. Um, and they could all be taken apart to assemble a pit in any way. So it could actually be broken out to be like two different sub conversations in different parts of the um, space. Yeah, it's a great question though, because it is, uh, it, it looks like a bunch of rectangles. It is based on the human body. It is, it is actually fairly comfortable, oddly. It doesn't seem like it when you look at it here. Um, and the, the, it also allowed us to do something kind of interesting, was, was channel uh, a kind of desire that a lot of artists have, like to play with building modernist kind of sculpture, mm -hmm. uh, modular sculpture. It's a toy in a way, mm -hmm. you know? It's, it's also, it's meant to be playful. Like that's another thing that could be signaled to a group that's meeting there. But this is not a place to express authority and shout down the opposition. It's a place to play and to experiment and to try out someone else's idea and see if you could agree with that. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Great question. That was a good question. Um, who else? Okay, got one out here. Hello. Hi. Um, so, as of like the the even the pit today, like most of our classrooms are kind of like how they were before the pit. They're they're not necessarily as like like cut off or anything. Like everything's more more kind of in a community based setting, but the structure is different. Is there any like any correlation between the changing of the pit back to like a typical seating arrangement? Well, let me ask you this. Um, a typical classroom that I assume you're a UIS student? Yeah. A typical classroom that you walk into uh, and sit down, do you feel empowered to speak given the arrangement of the desks or the arrangement of the lectern or the, how do you feel about participation in your typical classroom setting? Depends on the professor, depends on the class. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, you, you feel empowered to speak and empowered to, to have an opinion, yeah. Good. So there's like a cultural conditioning that happens that makes that possible. Um, but even that, I think there, um, I really think we're um, in a very um, fragile moment related to education right now. And I think we need a hard reset um, with the way that we're operating. Um, I think um, students are coming to education um, in the role of um, being handled by a teacher or a curriculum or this kind of in industrial complex. 
Um, the, you know, there's a lot of um, thinking that's theoretical that supported a lot of our um, philosophies and teaching that um, end up not um, making sense on the ground, like constructivist learning theory, which is really that you all as students are the teachers. We are facilitators. We are resource managers. Um, in the K-12 system in the 90s, they were talking about student-centered education where every student would have an individual education plan. Um, the idea of an individual education plan lives in our school um, systems for people who have challenges and need them to connect to resources. Um, so I think we all need to kind of reset uh, the culture of learning. Um, you know, so this is a really good example. If you have um, a teacher who operates as a facilitator who flattens things and leads by opening things up, people feel that fluidity. But for the most part, for the most part this is the language of academia. There's two schmucks up here who really don't know that much, who are put into a place of authority and a lot of the times the people in this position um, really feel good about themselves because of uh, names like professor and things like that. And then there's some bullshit respect that's supposed to happen because they're the professor and you're the student. But that should be approached as um, some sort of like collaborative venture. So it feels like there needs to be a philosophical reset and then resource management from the K-12 system all the way forward. But there's also the hard reality of, you know, how do you do something like this without this, you know, stage and, and right. front I'm, of I'm the I'm feeling room. it right now, by the way. You know, this, I, I'm pointed at you and mm -hmm. you're pointed at me. You're not pointed at each other, okay? You're right. all pointed. If you look at this, everyone has an opportunity to look in everyone else's eyes as they sit in this furniture. So while I was asking you the question about the typical classroom that you're in, there's usually a row of desks and you're looking at the back of someone's head, right. okay? You're not looking at their face or their mouth or listening. To, if they talk in front of you, you can't see the expressions on their face, okay? Mm -hmm. So that is, an, even if you have a fantastic professor who's facilitating, there's some structural things there, some physical, right. spatial things that are happening there. And you see it breaking down in a seminar course, you know, the, the structure of a seminar course. You all go away, you read something, or, or you metabolize something in some way on your own. And then more often than not, you're around a table together in a cir circle, and you take advantage of this, like, adjacent brain to metabolize together. And it seemed like, I, you know, it's easy for us to romanticize what was happening there. You know, they could have, it could have not been any better but you know it allows for things to be flattened and for people all people to be seen and have space potentially and you know if you want to hear more about that the, the convening that we're doing on the 16th on Saturday one of the original faculty members Larry Golden is one of our discussants and he he taught in the pit and he's going to give us a little bit of that uh, philosophy that underpinned uh, those mm -hmm. classes and he, he and really felt it was a difference maker in his classes. Yeah, and I think it, it um, I feel like there's an echo here um, but I mean, uh, <laughs> Larry also when we talked with him years ago I think he talked about how um, they would also like go into a cornfield or go down to the lake and there's a certain porosity that the walls of the campus end up having when you have that in the like relationship um, within the people in a classroom as well. We have a few more minutes. Somebody else got a killer question? I'll sit over here. Yeah. <laughs> Spatially, we're not working real well right now. Um, as a future teacher, I was wondering, um, do you think more classrooms are going to go to this alternative seating arrangement? I know there is some teachers that have started doing it and allowing their kids to sit in different places, but do you think it will start becoming more available? I think you're seeing, um, my partner teaches um, in uh, primary school, and I had uh, one of my degrees was in K-12 education before going into art. And uh, one of the things that was happening in the 90s is they were starting to like really um, sh get data related to class size and the impact on learning outcomes. And then I think what has happened since the 90s is they're starting to see like the full life of a child's like um, attention span and physicality throughout a day, and that's changing. Um, so uh, the classrooms that I've been in 
uh, the last 10, 15 years. They're ten, the, the probably K-5 classrooms um, tend to be more kind of circular. There's definitely a desk or like a um, cockpit, but there's also the thing we don't talk a lot, a lot about is there's people in this room right now who really don't feel right sitting on a chair. You know, so we're starting to see when we were all kids, you sat on the chair or you didn't. Now they have yoga balls and they have um, places to sit on the floor. And so I, I think there's also, um, there's more sensitivity to like the individual. Um, a lot of the people in our generation were forced into being right-handed uh, writers. And there's, there's a lot of different things happening related to design and classroom spaces. Yeah, I wanted to add more and more thing to that, though, and this is another thing we're touching on with the education discussion we're doing on Saturday. We have a member of the Chatham School Board who is part of the discussion, along with high school students in the room and professors and whatever. Um, there's a fundamental issue. We could all one want to teach in these ideal situations. We could all dream that we can teach in our, but schools are overcrowded, right? You know, they're packing more and more kids in. Teachers are underpaid. Facilities are lacking in many places, especially in lower income communities, right? So these ideal notions about, hey, we could do this and it'd fix everything. Uh, this takes resources. This takes people spending time that they're being paid to spend time thinking about things like mm -hmm. this. And right now our system is overcrowded. It's overworked. It's strained and especially in lower income or socioeconomic areas uh, where there aren't the resources, they don't have a thought about something like this. They're trying to get through a day and get people through the program <laughs> and move them to the next grade. And so mm -hmm. these are the kind of things we want to talk about too, like where the rubber hits the road. Like what are the realities? Um, and mm -hmm. what are the dreams, but what are the real realities and what are the consequences of those realities. Yeah, right. and, and I think that's what's exciting to me about Saturday because um, we're going to have the administrator, the educator, and the student in a place where um, they aren't ever together, you know. Um, and it's not to find solutions, but maybe to understand um, where each other are coming from. The seed for this idea was this project we were um, working on a long time ago where we realized that something like 60% of funding related to social services goes unused. Uh, I come from a family that has uh, used social services quite a bit, and we have a lot of scrappy people who can find social services. Uh, but those of you who have um, taken advantage of social services know that many of them require you to have a computer or you have to have records, uh, tax records, or there's like a lot of things that are at, um, barriers to access. And so our original seed for this was um, to put um, housing providers in place with um, user groups to understand just application processes. So I, I'm really excited to have um, administrators, teachers, and students talking from across these positions to first just understand uh, what's happening. But there's a lot of um, questions here. I want to make sure we could get to them. We got time for a couple more. Okay. Hi. Hey, Andy. You hey, are Andy. just starting an experiment, so I'm jumping to conclusions. All right. Are you negotiating uh, space for a permanent installation? Well, um, you are jumping to conclusions, but. Um, <laughs> No, we, we want this piece to continue, right? So we want, like, this is the, we have the core, we have the nugget here, we have the concept. This could move, think if this wasn't in Springfield, Illinois. What if this was in Chicago? What if this was in, you know, Mexico City? What if this, you know, what would happen? What would those discussions be like? And again, this is the beauty of this sort of aesthetic or this kind of art strategy that, of convening. It's not about our content. We're creating a platform, we're creating a structure that others can come in and have these valuable conversations or maybe not valuable conversations. Mm -hmm. We don't know, it's an experiment. But um, yes, we would love to put this model into action in many places. Rather than make it permanent somewhere, move it. Mm -hmm. Movable feast. We mm -hmm. want it to happen in every community that we can get it to. Mm -hmm. You know, we want, to, we want to hear, and one thing that we really are interested in, and this is uh, a requirement that we have for folks who use the space, uh, we want some kind of record, okay? Because we're building an archive of all the discussions that happen mm -hmm. in this context. So 
Uh, video is great, you know, but not everyone's comfortable being videotaped and saying what they really think. We've talked about surveys. We've talked about uh, individual just statements from, in, from the people who participated. But we want some kind of record uh, of these discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it happens across many communities, mm -hmm. a much richer record starts to emerge. It's so great to do Q&A because you realize like the things you um, Should have left said. out, you know, um, but Thanks, to, Andy. to be clear, the model here is not necessarily about um, furniture in a space. It's about experimenting with a methodology to talk across a position. And Mike and I, uh, we planned for this. We drew it. We did these tests. We um, we're bleeding for days, and then we get this thing all up there, and this is um, undeniably related to Sangamon State, but you uh, realize that you don't need that. You know, so I think ultimately the experiment here is to try to kind of figure out what a methodology is to, cro to talk across a position. And so maybe this is um, like sourdough starter where you take a little piece of this and then you grow it with something else in a different place and maybe it takes on a formal DNA of that space or maybe it's just people in a park. Um, but it's really, this is just an experiment we're at the very beginning of and then we'll have to like look at the um, data to understand what well, it is. We're believers in site-specific you know, installation, site-specific art. So this is perfect for this site. This was a place where they used this. It's, it's pointing to our history here but it's also pointing to this talking across positions, which possibly was happening more in 1971 than it is happening now. Yeah. And uh, so it's a symbol. Like Artists use symbols. We use cues. We're trying to give the audience a little nudge, like uh, mm -hmm. talk to each other in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. In this case, it's this furniture that channels this thing that happened in 1971. In Boston, it might be some totally different configuration. In Mexico City, it would be something else, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it needs to be site specific. It needs to be some logic that occurs and uh, is compatible and, uh, and relatable to the audience, the community, as it exists. Yeah, great point. I, I think that um, you know this brings up a, a question that keeps coming through my mind is what can you learn from the site specific that you can bring to a virtual mm. um, learning environment or a virtual opportunity to bring people together mm -hmm. for that conversation? You know, there's this uh, great book called Sapiens. I'm sure you've read it, Lynn, um, that... Um, now that you're here, I'm not sure I should even bring it up because I definitely can't do it justice. But one of the things that um, we've been around for like 300,000 years, uh, mostly as a band or clan system, where we um, operated through empathy and necessity. We, a lot of things happened because we needed to work cooperati cooperatively, it was natural. And then we had farming and the ability to kind of divide labor and have these massive um, societal structures. Um, and there ends up being less empathy through necessity and things like that. But Harari um, focuses completely on this idea of story, you know, this shared mythology and this kind of collective culture that governs the way that um, people are capable of acting um, bad or good or for balance or destruction or things like that. And it seems like one of the things that's problematic about the virtual space that we all have been seeing is um, it allows for people not to be accountable or mm -hmm. not to be a stakeholder in the same way or not to kind of share a story in the same way. So um, a lot of us in this room have been flicked off uh, in, uh, in a car. Um, nobody here has flicked anybody off, I'm sure. But when you're in a car, you feel emboldened to um, act transgressively toward another person. When you're sharing space with somebody, you can't, you know, in the same way. So I think there's, um, I, I'm, as an educator who weathered the uh, quarantine of, and, and want to find value in what happened, and um, I think that it's undeniably a resource, virtual spaces, um, but I think we also have to be real that like those virtual spaces do something we can't do in person um, and are productive in some ways, but also um, maybe not everything can be virtual. And there's something about um, also um, the, the size of a, um, a body to be able to share 
Um, so if you have like more than 150 people, it's difficult to organize. Um, you know, so we've all been in seminars where you have 10 people and it's amazing. And then you're in like a 100 person bio class and it's really flat, you know. Um, so there's something about um, size that allows things to be relational um, and proximity in real time that I think is important. But um, I think it can happen. There's this thing called um, better angels where people who um, are occupy positions um, across different political, um, um, the political spectrum get together virtually to talk. Um, and it's really great. Um, and it was really popular during quarantine. And then once people stopped quarantining, nobody went. You know, but it was really productive. And this is a good example of like people, we're all feeling divided and we need to understand. Um, and people needed to be together and they couldn't. But then once they could, they kind of retreat away from this like platform that's mm -hmm. more democratic. And everybody's in their own garages and houses now. J mm -hmm. Just an example of what we hope might happen in one of these sessions, the healthcare session. I mean, there really is going to be a pretty top level it, hospital administrator in the room with a homeless person who has mental health disorders. And those people are gonna sit in the same space. Now, whatever communication happens, the fact that they're sitting in that space together, that is nothing that has ever happened for either one of those people before, okay? They, they have not been in that position before. And that's different than being online with mm -hmm. that person or on the yeah. phone with yeah. that person. Um, yeah. There's an accountability that comes mm -hmm. from that. Thanks for your question. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like I like in person stuff. We'll take one more question and then we'll have time to go over and see the exhibit. Speaking of size, uh, just a question towards your process of creating this piece. When you were thinking about the sizes and how many people are going to come, uh, what is your like ideal uh, size of group for this piece? Because mm -hmm. Like you said, like 100 people is too many and right. there's too many opinions and then a small group. That's a, a great easier. question. And um, I think that if you're, whether you're working as a potter or a painter or a furniture designer or an installation artist, there's always constraints that you have to be aware of from the get-go. So the, the gallery space itself that is the the, the primary space really can't accommodate uh, probably more than 60 people shoulder to shoulder. Um, but we tried to make this in such a way that everything could be taken apart. So there, you could convene, um, you know, this could probably seat like a class, you know, 15 to 25 people, but these could all be taken off stack and probably be doubled um, to accommodate like a full room. But really this, this room is a nice size room, but it, it can't accommodate uh, probably more than 50 or 60, I'd imagine. And, and back to the reality, we built all this in like six days. So this was the maximum That's amount awesome. of things we could build in six yeah. days. <laughs> well, As great job. Yes, thank you for bringing this to um, UIS and for the opportunity for everyone to be able to use it and create and innovate. So um, we'll be moving over towards the exhibition. Um, here shortly so you can all come along. Do HSB 201, if you don't know, that's where the gallery is. Thank you. Thank you.